Good morning. I'm Lynn Hubley, and I'm the interim pastor of the First Baptist Church in San Borton, New Hampshire. And I'm so glad to be back with you today. This is our second time of doing an online service. You know, how often do we say the church uh, is not the building, the church is the people, but boy, have we been given um, an object lesson, haven't we, on just how true that is. The church is the people of God, and the Bible tells us that the church will always prevail, and right now it just looks a little different. Today being Palm Sunday and Communion Sunday, uh, we're going to have an opportunity to share communion together uh, right after the message. So if you want to hit pause right now, uh, go and get yourself some bread or crackers or some juice. And um, what we'll do is we'll put that aside and then we'll take that together after the message. Uh, I'm just going to tell you what I did. I got some cornbread and I got some water. But I actually found um, an old, not an old, but it, well, it is old. It's a teacup and saucer. And it was given to me by a very dear friend. It belonged to her mother. And it's very, very special. So I put my communion on there. So you do uh, as you feel led. And um, like I said, set that aside and we'll do that after the message. Psalm 118.24 says, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, you may have woke up this morning and thought, you know, the last thing I want to do is rejoice. And you know what? I get that. I get that. There is a lot going on right now. There's a lot of isolation. There's loneliness. People are feeling stir-crazy. There's fear. There's anger. There's depression. There's anxiety. There's despair. You name it. But did you know that the writers of the Psalms experienced the same things, maybe even more. And you know what they did every time? They poured out their feelings to God and they always ended in praise because God is always worthy of praise. I've been reading uh, the letter of the Philippians that the Apostle Paul wrote. I've been, I've been looking at that this past week and reminded that Paul was actually in prison when he wrote that letter. He was waiting whether to hear whether he was going to be executed, and yet the entire theme of that letter is joy. In fact, in Philippians 4.4, 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. So what the writers of the Psalms and what the Apostle Paul had in common is they knew that regardless of our circumstances, we can still have joy. It's not dependent on them. They knew that the joy was because of their relationship with the Lord. A couple years ago, our, our daughter Taryn uh, wrote a song. Uh, her brother was getting ready to go off to college, so she wrote a song, and it's called My Guide. She wrote it, she sang it, and our, our son Matthew actually played the piano, accompanied it. And basically, it's a reminder that although everything is changing, God never changed. And we'd like to play that for you right now.
the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we desperately need you to be our guide. And what a wonderful reminder that although everything is changing, you never change. And that joy has nothing to do with our circumstances, but has everything to do with our relationship with you. Regardless of what is happening in our world, in our lives, regardless that things are changing by the hour, you are on the throne and you are so worthy of our worship and our rejoicing. You, Lord God, are sovereign and you are filled with grace, mercy, goodness, faithfulness, forgiveness, and love. Hear our heartfelt cries for people who are alone and feeling isolated, people who have loved ones in hospitals and nursing homes and can't visit them, people who have contracted COVID-19 and other health struggles. We pray for protection over the medical personnel, first responders, essential businesses. We ask supernatural wisdom and strength for all of our government leaders as they navigate overwhelming challenges. Bless the organizations and the businesses who are helping in so many ways. And Lord, comfort those who are truly afraid and worried about putting food on the table. Be with people who don't have a relationship with you and open the door for believers to share the gospel. Father, show each of us how to be Jesus to a world that is so afraid. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray in this way, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I've titled uh, the message for this morning, The Very First Time. And we're going to be looking at Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. This is one of the four versions of the Palm Sunday story that is uh, told in the Gospels. And you know, one of the things that I'm so aware of, I know in my own life, is that it becomes a challenge when we uh, engage some of the more familiar texts. I mean, we can kind of come to them and just like we're going through the motions and we can think, oh, I know that one. And then we kind of tune it out or we start to think about other things. 
But as I read this uh, passage this morning, I just, I just challenge you, invite you to ask the Lord to try and help you to picture yourself there and have him help you um, read it, hear it, like it's the very first time. And just may I remind you this morning that what's going on in your life, what's going on in our entire world, is not a surprise to God. And he has a message for you this morning. He has a message for you today, Sunday, April 5th, 2020. He has a message for you. And let's hear it now from Matthew's Gospel 21, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, a foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks in the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. May God bless us with insight and understanding as we strive to apply God's word to our everyday lives. There is definitely a danger in the familiar, and I want to illustrate to you that by uh, giving you just a few illustrations. There was an Episcopal priest uh, who was preaching in an unfamiliar church one Sunday morning. And as we stood in the pulpit and he began the service, he tapped the microphone to see uh, if it was working. And he heard nothing, even though it was, in fact, working. So he leaned closer to the microphone and he said, there's something wrong with this. Well, this congregation, being well-trained church people, automatically responded, and also with you. I wasn't there, but boy, I hope, I hope everybody got a chuckle out of that. A couple of years ago, I was driving on 103A. It was in uh, New London, New Hampshire, and I was driving, my daughter was with me. And all of a sudden, she says to me, Mom, you just went through a stop sign. I'm like, what? When did they put that there? She's like, a year ago. And that's what happens, though. This is a road I've been on many, many times. It was totally familiar. And so what happens is we're just not as alert. The final illustration is this. Our family for years and years uh, did our summer vacations in Grantham, New Hampshire. And there was always this path, the same path we always took to go to the beach. It was a beautiful path. And one summer, uh, my sister and her family were visiting. So of course, we took them on the path. And we went to the beach. And we got to the beach. And my precious little nephew, Craig, just says, Oh, that was so cool. I can't believe how many turtles I saw along the road, you know, on the way. And I looked at him and I said, how did you see turtles? And, and he says to me, he says, Ani Lynn, how did you not see turtles? So today is Palm Sunday. It marks the beginning of Holy Week. And my prayer is that although this is a story that we've heard multiple times, perhaps before, that today we will look at it with fresh eyes as I share with you five observations from this text. And the first is this. The triumphal entry shows a very different side of Jesus than the one that we have seen up until this point. Jesus knows exactly what awaits him when he gets to Jerusalem. He's going there to fulfill his mission. Make no mistake about it, he was born to die. You talk about courageous, right? Not sneaking in at night, 
he comes when he comes. Riding on a donkey during a huge festival put Jesus at the center of attention. Prior to this, he had always avoided the spotlight. Go to John 2. Jesus is at a wedding. What does he say? My hour has not yet come. In John 6, we're told that the people wanted to make Jesus king by force. So what does he do? He withdraws to a mountain by himself to pray. How many times did Jesus instruct those whom he healed to not tell anyone because it wasn't time? Well, guess what? The hour has come. It's time for Jesus to fulfill his mission. And that leads us to the second observation. There was nothing spontaneous about any of this. It was planned, it was organized, and it was prophesied. The religious leaders might have thought that they got to decide when Jesus was going to die, but guess what? They don't get to decide. God is in control of this mission. This is God's plan that he's going to die, not theirs. Includes just a small detail, Jesus' means of transportation. Riding on a donkey was prophesied years before. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Also part of God's plan was that his death be during Passover. That was absolutely intentional. The Jews came from every part of the earth to celebrate Passover and the, the celebration of Passover. And if you remember, this was a huge deal for them. This was their time to remember what had happened to their ancestors. They're, they're uh, being delivered from slavery in Egypt. And maybe you remember the story on the night that has been called Passover, the Israelites would slaughter a lamb, they would take the blood, they'd apply it to the doorposts, and the blood of the lamb would be recognized by the angel of death who would then pass over and protect the firstborn child that lived in that home from being killed. Don't miss the powerful symbolism. Don't miss this. While Jesus was dying on the cross as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the entire world, while he was being the ultimate sacrifice, lambs were being slaughtered all over Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And to give you an idea of maybe how many people were there, there was one time when they did a, a census of how many slain lambs there were. They counted 256,000. Every lamb could feed 10 people, so there was a very strong possibility that there was about 2.7 million people at this Passover feast. God chose the busiest time in Jerusalem to carry out his mission, and it was totally planned and not spontaneous. A third observation, the way that Jesus came into Jerusalem, the means of transportation, would turn the expectations of people upside down in terms of what kind of king they thought Jesus was. They, they never got it. They didn't understand who he was or why he came. They expected that he came to save them from the Roman officials. That is why they spread their cloaks. It's why they took branches and laid them down. It's why they yelled Hosanna, which means save now. That is why they were worshiping Jesus in Jerusalem, because of what they'd seen him do, but also because what they expected him to do. They were expecting a warrior ready for war. But if he was a warrior, he would have rode on a horse. Kings rode on donkeys during times of peace. So imagine the confusion in their minds when Jesus comes in on a baby donkey instead of a white stallion with a plan to save them from sin, from death, and from hell. Another observation, and this is about some of the people who were there in the crowd. Obviously, great numbers of people were there to celebrate the Passover, perhaps 2.7 million people. Roman soldiers were there to make sure that the crowds didn't get out of control. 
They were followers who loved Jesus, and they were religious leaders who absolutely hated him and wanted to kill him. The religious leaders, who were the ones who should have known who Jesus was, they were the ones who knew the scriptures. They're the ones who really knew the prophecies. And yet Messiah was right in front of them, and they missed it entirely. This is how distorted they were. They were different religious groups. They were Pharisees and scribes. One group was called the Sadducees, and one of their beliefs was that they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. So imagine the tailspin that they went into when they learned that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. People would no longer find their teaching credible. So guess what they did? The chief priests actually planned to kill Lazarus, to kill Lazarus, to protect their own teaching. That's how distorted they actually were. Other people in the crowd there would have been just, they were just there for the show. Come on, Jesus, what, what can you give us? Show us a miracle, or, or can you give us another meal ticket? Remember, he fed the 5,000. A final observation that I want to share with you is this. Every single detail in this Palm Sunday narrative through Holy Week was to demonstrate the love of a father who wanted to be reconciled to his children. And the only way for this to happen was to be giving his begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. May we never become so familiar with that that it loses its power and its impact to change our lives and the lives of others. And I want to close with you an illustration that I hope um, will illustrate this. About 15 years I was um, pastoring at, it was called the First Baptist Church of Bradford then, it's now Bradford Community. And I remember I was, and I'm sure you've had this experience, I was just going through the motions uh, with my faith, you know, just kind of going through it. And our music director um, had had a dream, and she really felt like God wanted her to put on the musical Godspell. And so lots of people from our church uh, got to be in it, and it was, it was an amazing experience, including myself. I was able to, to be in it. And we also had the blessing of having a few students from New England College uh, come and, and play parts too. And one in particular uh, played the part of Jesus. And I cannot tell you what a phenomenal job um, he did. In fact, we heard testimonies after uh, that a couple of the students from New England College actually had renewed their faith in Christ. It was a beautiful testimony. But I'll never forget the scene where Jesus is hanging on the cross and the tears are just pouring down my face, okay? I mean, they were supposed to be. That was part of the, the part that I was playing. And I remember someone coming up to me after and saying, Wow, Lynn, I, you know, I had no idea that you could act. And I'll never forget telling you, I said, I was not acting. I was not acting. The tears were real. And for the first time in a long, long time, I really understood and appreciated what my Savior did for me. That was a life-changing experience. You know, you and I get so busy. We get so caught up in what we're doing. We get so distracted. And right now, every single one of us is being forced to hit the pause button. And that is a really good thing. And as we now prepare our hearts to share in communion and to remember the most amazing thing that has ever been done ever in the history of this world, that Jesus Christ would go to that cross and give up his life for you and for me out of sheer love. Let's use this time now as we prepare our hearts to ask God to remember once again, to see that with fresh eyes, and to realize what he did for us and, and just to remember it like it was the very first time. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, this story was told in four different Gospels. 
And I love the version that John, or actually that Luke shares in his version. And the Pharisees are complaining that people are praising Jesus. And Jesus replies, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The disciples were praising God in loud voices. And Jesus says, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Lord, we are on the other end of the cross. And we have so many reasons to praise you and rejoice. We are on the other end of the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension. We are the recipients of the Holy Spirit. We know that one day Jesus will return and take us home to be with him. We know that God exalted him in the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Regardless of the uncertainties that we are all facing now, Lord, all of these remain true. And Father, we're reminded that your light always shines brightest in the darkest of times. As we enjoy some quiet meditation now to prepare our hearts to share communion and remember what Jesus did, may we see these truths like it were for the very first time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed and deserted by his closest friends, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of him. In the same manner after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this cup, you proclaim his name until he comes again. Take and drink in remembrance of him. Father, we love you. And as we come into this most precious Holy Week, and as we're rereading all the accounts of Jesus' crucifixion and uh, all that he went through, again, Lord, we ask that you would help us to read them like it was the very first time and recommit our lives to you. And Lord, every day, when our eyes first wake up, when we first put our feet on the floor, may the first words of our why, out of our, our mouths be, praise the Lord, rejoice in the Lord. We have so many reasons to rejoice and praise the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so grateful that you uh, joined me this morning. Uh, may God bless you your week. And next week when we come together, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Go in peace. Amen.